common rebuttal put forth by those opposed to modern scientific thought when presented with a clear and irrefutable observation of evolution is, that's just microevolution, not macroevolution. I believe in microevolution because that's just adaptation. No one has ever seen one kind of animal become another kind. That's macroevolution, and that's impossible. Disregarding the fact that even Answers in Genesis thinks this is a failed argument, it's about time we clear up the confusion surrounding these terms. First, what exactly is evolution? In its simplest form, evolution is a change in allele frequencies within a population over time. Alleles are just different versions of a single gene. For example, there are three alleles for the gene that sets blood type, A, B, and O. We each have two copies of this gene, one from our mother and one from our father, and any allele combination is possible. A person with an A allele and a B allele is considered blood type AB. A person with two O alleles is blood type O. In the human population as a whole, 66.3% of the alleles are O, 26.4% are A, and 7.3% are B. Now if those percentages were to change, for whatever reason, be it a disease that only kills people with the A allele, a shortage of type B blood during a global disaster, or simply random chance, that would be evolution. Plain and simple. If the allele frequencies change over time, which is over generations, that is evolution. Now I can already hear the cries from some in the audience. That's just microevolution. Humans are still humans regardless of blood type. No new information was added to the genome. Okay, so what exactly is the difference between microevolution and macroevolution? Would you believe me if I told you that the evolution of these two mosquitoes from a common ancestor is an example of macroevolution? While the evolution of these two dogs from their common ancestor is an example of microevolution or the evolution of these two plants is an example of macroevolution, while the evolution of corn from Teosinte, its wild ancestor, is an example of microevolution. Now some of you may be scratching your heads. How can it be that the examples which show a large change in appearance are microevolution, while those that show a small change in appearance are macroevolution? It's because micro and macro have little to nothing to do with appearances or the size of the change. Macroevolution is defined as a change that occurs at or above the species level. Biological species are generally defined based on whether two populations can interbreed. So because appearance has little influence on whether two populations can interbreed, macroevolution does not mean a large change in appearance. Put more simply, if two populations evolve so that they can no longer produce viable offspring between them, meaning they can't reproduce at all or their offspring are sterile, then they have become two separate species, and that change, no matter how small, is an example of macroevolution. However, Populations can evolve to look very different, yet if they can still produce viable offspring between them, they are still the same species, and those changes, no matter how large, are microevolution. At the DNA level, micro and macroevolution are exactly the same. It's how they manifest themselves that sets them apart. Now, while it is possible for a single small genetic change to result in a new species and hence be an example of macroevolution, it is generally agreed by the scientific community that two populations, originally of the same species, if isolated long enough, can gradually accumulate enough small mutations, microevolution, that they become genetically incompatible and hence evolve into two separate species, macroevolution. So while macroevolution can be a small change that spreads rapidly through a population, it can also be the slow, gradual accumulation of many microevolutionary events. So what about their other complaints? Well, every single mutation that is selected for and spread throughout the population by definition, according to information theory as defined in the field of mathematics, increases the information content in a genome. Also, nucleotide insertions, 
gene duplications and chromosome duplications add more DNA and thereby more information to the genome. And what about the evolution of new structures? The sequel valves in the Italian wall lizards, while an example of a microevolutionary change, is a perfect example. Lastly, some argue that no kind has ever been observed to evolve into a different kind. Answers in Genesis makes this point repeatedly throughout their website. Technically, until the word kind is defined, this argument cannot be addressed. If kind means species, then yes, there are dozens of examples of the evolution of new species, which as we have already seen is just macroevolution. If they mean a dog evolving into a cat, for example, that by definition is impossible, and any observation would actually disprove the theory of evolution. Why? If you look at an evolutionary tree, you'll see that dogs and cats are on separate branches. All descendants from modern dogs will be confined to the dog branch, and all descendants from modern cats will be confined to the cat branch. It is physically impossible for an organism on one branch to give birth to an offspring that is rooted to a different branch, meaning a dog cannot give birth to a cat. Now that doesn't mean a population of dogs couldn't evolve to look like cats. They could, but they would never be cats. I would like to point out that at one point Answers in Genesis states that all finches are of one kind, while at another point they state that all dinosaurs are of the same kind. The word kind to them simply means a group, just like policemen are a kind of person. And if a dog ever did somehow evolve into a cat, they could simply claim dogs and cats are both of the mammal kind, and this is therefore not evidence of evolution of a new kind. They have routinely shown they are willing to alter the meaning of a word to avoid ever having to concede they are wrong. It is just another example of their profound intellectual dishonesty. So there you have it. Microevolution is any change, no matter how large, that doesn't result in a new species, while macroevolution is any change, no matter how small, that does result in a new species. At the DNA level, both are identical. They are simply evolution, the change in allele frequencies in a population over time. Both have been directly observed, along with mutations that add information to the genome and mutations that produce new structures. The biggest problem people have with the theory of evolution is their own ignorance of the science and the words used to describe it.